Hi, this is Nurse Inga, and you're watching Medications for Chronic Cardiac Disease. Before we begin talking about the medications, let's review some of the vocabulary that pertains to the way that the heart works. Chronotropic drugs influence heart rate. A positive chronotrope will speed up the heart rate, and a negative chronotrope will decrease the heart rate. A dromotrope is a drug that influences electrical conduction or automaticity. A positive dronotrope increases the ability of cells to conduct electricity, and a negative dromotrope decreases that ability. That also will influence heart rate. An inotrope is a drug that influences the force of contractions. A positive inotrope increases the stroke volume or the force of contraction, while a negative inotrope decreases the force of contraction. Many of our common cardiac medications work by either stimulating or suppressing alpha and beta receptors. Alpha-1 causes vasoconstriction and an increase in blood pressure. Alpha-2 blocks the action of alpha-1. Beta-1 increases the rate, force, and automaticity of the heart, increasing blood pressure, while beta-2 has its actions in the lungs, promoting bronchodilation and increased blood flow. Some common cardiovascular medication classes include adrenergic drugs, which is the sympathetic nervous system mediated medications, ACE inhibitors that decrease afterload by blocking the formation of angiotensin II, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor, ARBs or angiotensin receptor blocker drugs that decrease afterload by blocking the action of angiotensin II at the receptor sites, Beta blocker drugs, which decrease cardiac output by decreasing heart rate, force, and electrical conduction. Cardiac glycosides, like digoxin, that decrease the heart rate and increase the force of contraction. So they are a positive inotrope and a negative chronotrope. Calcium channel blocking drugs, which decrease preload and afterload through arterial dilation and decreasing the heart rate and force of contraction. Diuretics, which decrease the preload, afterload, and workload of the heart and decrease pulmonary congestion. And nitrates, which decrease preload and afterload if they are arterial dilators like hydralazine through peripheral vasodilation. Our goals when medicating the chronic cardiac disease patient include medications that will stop the aggregation of blood components to the injured endothelium, Controlling the factors that led to the damage of the endothelium, such as lipid management, hypertension management, and control of glucose, smoking cessation, stress, diet, exercise, and weight management. And to relieve the symptoms caused by the disease process, such as angina, activity intolerance, and uh, orthopnea or dyspnea. Some medications that we commonly use in the management of coronary artery disease and cardiac complaints include drugs that lower cholesterol, such as our statins, our fibric acids, our nicotinic acids, and our bile acid sequestrants, antiplatelet medications, such as aspirin, and medications that decrease blood pressure and myocardial workload or oxygen demand, such as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and vasodilators. Remember that blood pressure is created through the forces of cardiac output and peripheral vascular resistance. So meds that control hypertension work to decrease stroke volume, heart rate, and or peripheral vascular resistance. Atherosclerosis occurs when there's a buildup of low density lipid particles on the walls of the arteries, and this is thought to occur in response to injury to the endothelial linings of the vessel. These deposits or plaques create an inflammatory response within the vessels that leads to decreased or obstructed blood flow and therefore tissue ischemia, infarct, and necrosis. When we're managing cholesterol, our goals of therapy are to increase the good cholesterol or HDL to greater than 40 milligrams per deciliter and to decrease the bad cholesterol or LDLs to less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. In addition to LDL, we also track triglyceride levels to make sure that they're less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. These uh, goals can be accomplished through things like diet, exercise, smoking, cessation, 
um, eating healthy fats, but then also we can add in lipid lowering medications. So the statins reduce the cholesterol synthesis within the liver and increase the amount of uh, cholesterol or LDL that's cleared from the blood. Fibric acids inhibit the absorption of cholesterol from flu food in the small intestine. So your body just doesn't absorb as much cholesterol, but your liver can still make cholesterol. Nicotinic acid reduces the production of triglycerides and very low density lipids or VLDLs, but, and it also increases your HDL levels and your, your good uh, cholesterol. And bile acid sequestrants blocks bile acid absorption in the intestine, which forces the liver to convert cholesterol into bile acids, which lowers the cholesterol in the blood. Let's look very specifically for a moment some of the statins. So simvastatin, atorvastatin, lovastatin, these are our medications that are commonly prescribed um, to lower lipids in patients who uh, either have high cardiovascular disease risk or who have high uh, lipid levels in their bloods. Statins um, can cause an alteration in liver function. So it's important that we monitor liver function tests and they also can uh, cause muscle myopathies. So look for things like leg cramps. They should not be used in someone who has impaired liver function and they're not used during pregnancy. You should administer statins with food to enhance absorption. And the most common side effects of statins are GI related. Uh, abdominal cramping, constipation, heartburn, diarrhea, and flatulence are all common side effects of statin. Aspirin is used to decrease platelet aggregation in the bloodstream. This prevents clot formation at the site of endothelial injury. Aspirin should be used cautiously in patients who have allergies, specifically the allergic triad of asthma, allergies, and nasal polyps, as patients with the allergic triad have an increased risk of allergic reaction to salicylates. Patients with NSAID allergies are often allergic to aspirin as well. Patients with active GI bleeding and peptic ulcer disease are not candidates for aspirin therapy. However, patients who have a history of GI bleeds or a history of peptic ulcer disease are administered aspirin during an acute MI. The most common side effects are GI related and those include dyspepsia, epigastric distress, and nausea. These can be decreased by giving baby aspirin chewed, administering regular aspirin with food, or using enteric-coated aspirin so that the medication bypasses the stomach. Monitor for signs of toxicity that include ringing in the ears, headache, hyperventilation, which causes an early respiratory alkalosis, and then metabolic acidosis from the salicyclic acid, agitation, mental confusion, lethargy, diarrhea, and sweating. Beta-1 adrenergic receptor blockers, or beta blockers, are negative inotropes, negative chronotropes, and negative dromotropes. They decrease the heart rate, the force of contraction, and electrical conduction through the heart. This decreases blood pressure by decreasing the stroke volume and the heart rate. Therefore, we have a decreased cardiac workload and a decreased myocardial oxygen demand. You should assess heart rate and blood pressure prior to administration and watch for orthostatic hypotension. Beta blockers can impact glucose levels, causing both hypo and hyperglycemia in patients who have impaired glucose metabolism. There are both non-selective and selective beta blockers. A non-selective beta blocker such as propranolol will have effects on both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Therefore, patients who have uh, bronchospastic disease, such as asthma, can end up with a side effect of bronchospasm from a non-selective beta blocker. Selective beta blockers, such as metoprolol, select specifically for beta-1 receptors and not beta-2. However, in very high doses, they too can have bronchospasm. There are also mixed alpha-beta drugs on the market. Drugs like carvedilol select for alpha-1, but are non-selective when it comes to beta receptors, and they also can cause bronchospasm. Side effects of beta blockers include bradycardia, altered mental status, GI disturbances, 
congestive heart failure from a lack of adequate pumping and cardiac output, hypotension, and depression. It's important to remember that the main way that we compensate for a decrease in blood pressure is to increase our heart rate. And a patient taking a blood uh, beta blocker cannot increase their heart rate to compensate for shock. So the normal signs of compensation may not be present in a patient taking a beta blocker. A patient who is taking a beta blocker who is experiencing anaphylaxis may also not be able to respond to the normal effects of epinephrine since it is blocking the action of the epinephrine at the receptor sites. Calcium channel blockers are drugs that are used frequently for cardiovascular disease patients because they come at blood pressure or hypertension from every angle. They decrease arterial constriction, which decreases peripheral vascular resistance. They decrease heart rate and force of contraction. So therefore they decrease heart rate, stroke volume and peripheral vascular resistance, which leads to decreased cardiac output and decreased blood pressure. They also dilate the coronary arteries, which increases myocardial perfusion. There are three different types of calcium channel blockers, and they can be represented by the drugs verapamil, which is used for hypertension, angina, tachycardia, and headaches, nifedipine, which is used for hypertension, angina, headaches, and heart failure, and diltiazem, which is used for hypertension, angina, and tachycardia. It's important when using calcium channel blockers, specifically verapamil and diltiazem, to watch for heart failure. Um, and again, thinking about fluid balances, the best measurement of fluid balance would be measuring weight. And then you want to watch INOs and listen to lung sounds for crackles. The most common side effects of calcium channel blockers include uh, hypotension, bradycardia, um, atrioventricular blocks, headaches, abdominal discomfort like constipation and nausea, and peripheral edema. Vasodilators decrease preload, which decreases then the stretch and the force of contraction, so stroke volume and cardiac output are decreased as well as blood pressure. Nitroglycerin dilates the coronary arteries and increases the oxygen supply to the heart. Nitroglycerin very specifically dilates the peripheral vasculature of the venous side, which again decreases preload and oxygen demand. And it also dilates the coronary arteries, which increases the myocardial perfusion. Nitroglycerin is used sublingually. It can also be used um, as a patch or as an ointment, so topically through the skin. Uh, we use it IV root as well in the critical care settings. Isosorbide dinitrate or isosorbide mononitrite is also used as a longer acting nitrite that can be used to treat or to prevent angina. This can be used as sublingual or an oral pill form taken multiple times a day, um, or it can also be given intravenously. With all of our vasodilators, it's important to monitor for hypotension orthostatic hypotension particularly, and dizziness can result with a low blood pressure. As the blood pressure decreases, the body's baroreceptors recognize a decrease in blood volume and may signal the heart to speed up. So reflex tachycardia is a possibility. And headaches are a very common side effect of nitrate therapy. It's important that the person avoids alcohol while taking vasodilators. Patient education is key to safety for the person who is taking nitrates. If they develop chest pain, it's important that they rest, stop the activity that they were doing and relax. Anything that increases heart rate increases the oxygen demand. So that includes exercise or activity. It also includes includes anxiety or stress. Nitrostat, which is nitroglycerin sublingual, comes in a spray or tabs. It's meant to be used under the tongue. It should not be chewed or swallowed, which decreases the effects. The patient can use one tablet or spray every five minutes to a maximum of three doses. The patient should call 911 if they have 
an increased pain more than they normally have, or if the pain increases despite therapy. If they need to take more doses than they normally do uh, to alleviate the pain, or if there's a change in presentation or onset. Many physicians will also say that if the pain is not alleviated with the first dose of nitroglycerin, that they should start the ambulance um, and then the, you know, they could always sign off or cancel them if needed. One of the critical teaching points is that they should not use nitroglycerin with the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, which are the fill drugs. These are drugs that are used for erectile dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension, such as Cialis, Levitra, and Viagra. This can cause life-threatening hypotension um, that actually does not respond to uh, volume or pressors. Some other medications that are used for hypertension. Diuretics decrease preload, which decreases stretch and force of contraction. This decreases stroke volume, decreases cardiac output, and decreases blood pressure. Loop diuretics increase sodium, potassium, and chloride loss through the kidney, which increases water excretion. Aldosterone tells the kidney to retain sodium and lose potassium. While aldosterone receptor blockers, like spironolactone, cause the opposite effect they increase sodium loss and potassium retention, which increases water loss. It's important to remember that the kidneys are filtering the intravascular space, and the fluid is lost initially from the intravascular space, causing a relative hypotension. Eventually, the fluid will shift from the interstitial and intracellular spaces to replenish the intravascular space. But hypotension, especially orthostatic hypotension, is a common side effect of diuretics. There are many other side effects of diuretics depending on the site of action. So again, watch for orthostatic hypotension as well as electrolyte imbalances depending on the type of diuretic that you're using. Loop diuretics are used for things like heart failure, renal failure, pulmonary edema, hypertension. The side effects include autotoxicity, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia. Thiazide diuretics are frequently used for uh, hypertension, congestive heart failure as well, um, and they have a lot of side effects as well. Hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, um, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia. And then our spironolactone is used for um, blocking of aldosterone and as an adjunct to potassium wasting diuretics, such as our loop diuretics, also used for congestive heart failure. The side effects of that are hyperkalemia and acidosis. The RAS system is activated when the kidneys sense a drop in blood pressure or a drop in fluid volume. They release renin into the bloodstream that converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. That circulates to the lungs where angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE turns it into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 stimulates the adrenal gland to release aldosterone, which acts on the kidneys to reabsorb sodium and water and to release potassium. It also, angiotensin II, works on the blood vessels causing a sympathetic alpha stimulation or vasoconstriction. There are two classifications of medications that work to block the RAS pathway. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. These decrease afterload and preload by blocking the vasoconstrictor effects and stopping aldosterone secretion. Note that the mechanism of action is different for ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. ACE inhibitors exert their effects here, blocking the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, 
Well, aldosterone receptor blockers exert their effects here at the receptor sites for aldosterone. When the ACE inhibitor blocks the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, or actually the effects of the angiotensin converging enzyme, it also blocks the effects or the ability of ACE, or also referred to as kinase, from breaking down bradykinins in the lungs. And therefore, the most common side effect of an ACE inhibitor is a dry cough. If the body accumulates too many bradykinins, we can have a sudden episode of angioedema. And this is more common in our patients who have African descent. ARBs can be used instead of or in combination with ACE inhibitors. Usually they replace ACE inhibitors in patients who are at high risk for angioedema and then can be used in combination with ACE inhibitors when therapy on an ACE inhibitor alone is subtherapeutic. ARBs and ACE inhibitors have a risk of diarrhea and hyperkalemia, and it's important to monitor fluid balance carefully when administering these medications. Centrally acting alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, or alpha-2 drugs, such as clonidine, reduce sympathetic outflow from the central nervous system. This decreases peripheral vascular resistance, decreases renal vascular resistance, and decreases heart rate and blood pressure. Clonidine, marketed as catapress, is commonly used for hypertension. This drug is also used for things like insomnia and anxiety or restlessness. The most common side effects then are central nervous system depression, such as drowsiness, orthostatic hypotension, which causes dizziness, and then constipation and sedation. An overdose in clonidine can result in severe hypertension initially and then hypotension, bradycardia, respiratory depression, and coma. Interestingly, because of the way that clonidine works within the central nervous system by stimulating the mu receptors, the respiratory depression caused by clonidine is actually responsive to naloxone or Narcan therapy to reverse the respiratory depression. Now let's look at some medications that can be used for chronic heart failure. Remember that the heart has two sides, a left and a right, and that we classify heart failure as left-sided or right-sided. Left-sided heart failure is usually caused by chronic hypertension or a problem with increased afterload. This causes a failure of the left ventricle, which then backs up into the lungs. The common signs and symptoms are crackles, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, pink frothy sputum. The patient will have a decreased cardiac output, activity intolerance, cyanosis, hypoxia, and decreased tissue perfusion. The most common cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure, where the increased pressure in the lungs eventually overwhelms the ability of the right ventricle to pump adequately, causing a backup into the periphery. And now we have peripheral congestion and edema. This can lead to ascites, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, decreased GI function, anorexia, and overall deconditioning. This leads to a decrease in muscle mass and weight loss despite edema and fluid retention. Heart failure or inadequate left ventricular uh, ejection fraction impacts over 5 million people in the United States with nearly another million people diagnosed every single year. The American Heart Association um, has coupled with the American College of Cardiology to stage heart failure. The New York Heart Association also classifies the functional status of patients who have heart failure. Um, stage A is at risk where there's no structural damage. Stage B, they have structural changes without signs or symptoms. These are people who are considered to be at risk. Stage C is the early signs or symptoms of heart failure uh, where they have structural disease and symptoms, and that's split into patients who have adequate and inadequate ejection fraction. And then stage D are patients who are end of life who have marked heart failure symptoms at rest despite um, excellent guideline-directed 
medical therapy and um, you can't manage their symptoms. So the overall treatment therapy is uh, to try to prevent you know, the, the progression of the disease. The drugs that are commonly used are our ACE inhibitors and our ARBs, statins, beta blockers, diuretics, um, hydralazine, and digoxin. Aldosterone antagonists are also used. And then non-medication therapies like an automated implanted um, cardiac defibrillator, revascularization, valve repair, and um, heart transplant would be kind of an end line therapy. So just to give you an idea, as the disease progresses, more invasive treatments are needed to help support cardiac function. In patients who are on the transplant list, they may be put on something like an LVAD um, or uh, be put on a, like a milrinone pump to um, promote adequate um, inotropic uh, work until they can receive a new. Hydralazine is um, a vasodilator that we did not talk about in terms of hypertension management, but this is a direct acting peripheral arterial vasodilator. So it decreases both afterload and blood pressure. One of the things about hydralazine is that it can cause a reflex baroreceptor activation in response to this decreased blood volume then causes tachycardia and activates the RAS system, which causes increased sodium retention and increased intravascular fluid retention. Um, so, it, you know, we have basically a decrease in our blood pressure that then activates the RAS system. Um, it also can cause drug-induced lupus, but this is also a, a nitrate uh, similar to nitroglycerin and isosorbide, except that hydralazine works on the arteries where the other two really work on the venous system and the coronary arteries specifically. Digoxin is a cardiac glycoside, which is a positive inotrope. That means it increases the force of myocardial contractions and it's a negative chronotrope. So it prolongs the refractory period of the AV node and decreases conduction through the SA and AV nodes, which slows down the heart rate. It's important to watch for bradycardia. You should oscillate an apical pulse for a full minute prior to medication. Withhold the dose and notify the provider if the heart rate is less than 60 for an adult, less than 70 for a child, or less than 90 for an infant. Digoxin toxicity is possible. Anorexia is the earliest symptom and bradycardia or arrhythmias is the earliest sign. The risk of toxicity is increased in patients who have low potassium or low magnesium or an elevated calcium. Patients who are elderly or who have poor renal clearance and patients who are on certain medications like different antibiotics or antiarrhythmics are at a higher risk for ditch toxicity. Thanks for watching. And I hope that this helps you remember some of your cardiac medications.